welcome to Close Buster. So to give everyone some background information on threading change, which is a play on words for spreading change, we're a youth-led global fashion ethical organization that focuses on building a feminist fossil fuel free fashion future. So the six F. Those are um, imperative to our mission. We're really passionate about it. And so that just uh, shapes the core of our work and our direction. And also a big thank you to Van City Credit Union for generously supporting our entire campaign. We really appreciate it. And it helps us do work like this. Um, so before we begin, we're going to be doing an acknowledgement, um, but for those of you that don't know me, so my name is Brenna kagawa Vizentine, and I'm the Textile Talks Coordinator at Threading Change. My pronouns are she, her, and I am so grateful to be working on and playing on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, coloni colonially known as Vancouver, BC. Um, and I just want to say, like, my relationship with the land goes far deeper beyond this acknowledgement, which can easily become a token gest gesture rather than a meaningful practice. Um, and for many of us, we're settlers. And so I think it is really important to take some time to just reflect on the history and the legacy of colonialism and also how your unique um, relationships with the land shape your life and who you are and, and the values that you have. Um, so, yeah, so I urge you to just take some reflective time today, um, maybe right now, and just think about, you know, what are some of the privileges that you enjoy today because of colonialism? And what are you doing as an individual beyond acknowledgement of territory where you live and work? And if you don't know, that's totally okay. Not knowing is usually a really great place to start and curiosity is a great tool to become more aware and to educate yourself on what you can do better. So Threading Change has a commitment to reconciliation and it's our moral responsibility as settlers. And if you haven't already, this is where we would love for um, folks to share in the chat where you're tuning in from. And if you actually don't know um, whose land you're on, Fernanda's going to share a link in the chat. Um, it's called whose.land and it helps you identify the Indigenous territory you're on. So I'm going to start talking about some other slides, but like, please just keep sharing in the chat because it's always so exciting to see where folks are coming in from. Okay, so meet our team. Um, while our team is cur currently based in Western Canada, our work is global in reach, um, and we know that it takes everybody to tackle fashion's dirty problem. And we have an amazing international team from Canada to Trinidad to Lebanon to India. Our team members are making waves in the fashion industry from all around the globe, um, and we're still growing, which is the great thing. So uh, this won't be the end of uh, the growth of our team. So to just give a little background on what we do, uh, Threading Change aims to work at the intersections of consumer education and industry transformation through our um, four impact models. So we know that the problems in the industry, they don't work in silos and neither do the solutions. So you're taking part right now in our education and awareness series but we're also working on our global innovation story map. Um, and that links together global ethical fashion brands, innovators, and fashion disruptors. And our last program is connecting the ties of the fashion industry to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And for anyone that doesn't know what the SDGs are, it's just a collection of 17 interlinked global goals um, designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And you can also find out more about them at sdgs.un.org. So this is just a little bit about what we do. And we're really excited to be growing these programs. So today's programming, so let's get into it. So kind of inspired by Marie Kondo, um, we know that this is around the time where people start to spring clean their wardrobes. You know, you have a maybe a bunch of clothes that you don't wear anymore or they're out of season and you know you don't know what to do with them but you know that you want to clean them out. So we hope to demystify that for you because there is a dark side to uh, clothing donations and our wonderful panelists will be shining a light on this which we're so excited about. Um, and so for a brief just review of what we're going to go over today, um, we're going to be introducing our panelists, we're going to be having our panel discussion, and then we want to talk a little bit about upcoming events, ways to stay in touch with us, and then we want to have a Q&A period. So if at any point um, while the panelists are speaking, you have a question that you're super interested about, um, Carissa is going to be minding the chat. So feel free to pop it in the chat and she'll be making note of them. And then um, if we have time later, which I'm pretty sure we will be, um, we'll be diving into those questions. 
So we're joined by three amazing panelists. We have Dr. Kate O'Neill. She's a professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California at Berkeley. She works on the global political economy of waste and discards amongst many other issues. And she's the author of Waste, published by Polity Press in 2019. We have Samuel and Tuyo Tang. He's a fashion designer and researcher from Ghana, and he was a finalist at the Gucci Design Fellowship Program in 2019, and he currently works as a fellow researcher and project coordinator with the OR Foundation, and he also is building his eclectic fashion brand, Otang. I also hope I said that properly. Um, and then last but not least, meet Ella. She's a Vancouver local. She's a sustainability and environmental educator, and she's really passionate about slow fashion, conscious consumerism, secondhand clothing, and many other issues. So let's get into it since we've introduced everybody. Um, and I really just want to try this. Amazing. Okay, I'm sorry that that was cheesy, but I really wanted to try that feature. Um, okay, so this question is for Kate and Samuel. So Kate and Samuel, what does the waste ecosystem look like in regard to clothing? And what is the dark side to clothing donation? Which of us do you want to go first? Um, honestly, it's totally up to you. Maybe you, Kate, since you, Maybe, since you yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, you right. um, I think I've got my camera on, so hopefully you can all see me. And I'm sorry that I'm in a, a, a light situation. I'm in a place where I don't normally um, live. So I am just trying to work out the setup there. However, um, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks um, for inviting me. Uh, again, Kate O'Neill, pronoun she, hers, and work on waste. Clothing is one of those things that um, people don't think about so much in terms of huge piles of waste. I actually first encountered this um, when I lived in the northern end of Manhattan, like well over 20 years ago, oh, 25 years ago now. And a friend of mine took me to this huge warehouse where you could buy clothing by the pound. Uh, for a dollar a pound, I think at that time. And I, that was like the first time I got interested in like, well, where is it all going? And finding out that, well, what we give to thrift stores isn't actually going necessarily to um, to be resold or, or for charity, it's getting shipped overseas. And um, this kind of stuck with me for ages until I uh, wound up getting back into uh, researching waste and the global politics of waste from my book. and. Uh, figuring out that not only was this still going on, but it massively increased due to the rise of fast fashion, which was not so much a thing when I was um, in my early 20s at all. And feeling like that this is, this is a practice that um, is effectively can be considered dumping on um, developing country markets. And Samuel probably can talk to this uh, more directly than I can, but this connects with some other things like we're probably familiar with things like food aid, where um, which is kind of a vehicle for dumping our excess surplus grain and and um, in and um, other products in the name of like ending hunger or dealing with crises, um, without necessarily enabling people to provide their own food there or to help them grow or whatever. It's just really for us, it's a matter of like dumping this food waste essentially on on other communities and clothing can be a little bit the same way. And so donations, it's, it's, a, tip, it's a difficult business, but I think, I think that, that donations have to be thought through and, and have to be carefully um, thought of in the way that how we get rid of it, but also the solution is upstream. And I think we're talking about that later on. So I will pass this over to Samuel. Okay, <laughs> thanks Kate. Um... So talking about um, clothing waste and like its ecosystem and black side about it, I think like um, when Kate was speaking, he touched on something that people don't really think about clothing. And I think that is true. Um, personally, I mean, I live in Ghana and even me being here, it took me a while before I realized like the problem at hand. And I think that is because like clothing is a, a very big part of us. I think nobody wakes up and you know, steps out, go about their work and go get food and water without putting clothes on. No matter how you think about it, even though food and, and water is a necessity, we all put clothes on our back before we decide to do any of these things that, you know, are also very necessary in our lives. But thinking about, you know, like clothing waste and then, you know, the dark side of it, 
all of these clothing, as, as, as Kay said, most of people give them as, as donations. And the whole idea is that it's going to be given out to poor people who don't have clothes to wear at all. But the thing is, aside from the, the, the idea of waste, all of this waste is built into you know, the fashion system and in the fast fashion system. Until this waste is being taken away, like being sent away or donated, that means there's no attachment. You know, you buy a piece of clothing, you know, for a week, like is poorly made. The, the quality of the product that is being used is very poor. So it doesn't even last. So all of these like agencies, all of these companies are trying to let you not get any attachment to this clothing. So you give them out to the nations. And then these have a lot of, a lot of clothing. In Cantamante alone, in Cantamante alone, there are about 50 million clothes coming in like in just a week. That is a lot. So these clothes come in and usually about just like a little percentage of the clothes that are coming in are, are resellable. That means everything else goes, goes into waste. Everything else goes into waste. And I just wanted to show some visuals. Um, I don't know if I'm able to share a screen. Um, I'll make you, I'll make you a host. Give me one okay. second. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, most people think that these clothes are being given out um, as, as, as donations and they don't really think about where it's going. All they know is they've donated it and it's going somewhere. But the truth is, as these clothes have been donated, they are being moved around like through several countries. And as they go, like they move to one country, like it's sorted and picked out, which is best to be sold. And as they move, the last spot is always like Ghana or like um, African countries. And when they end here, it is being sold. It's not for free, even though it's, it's, um, it's um, being sold as or being publicized as things being give, given out as donations, it's actually being sold. And the retailers in Cantamanto buy these bills between like 70 Five dollars and then five hundred dollars, depending on the quality or the the country it is coming from. So these bills are paid for, and the thing is, you um. The thing is, most people buy these ones, and it's always a gamble because you don't know what is, what you're going to find in the bill. Sometimes I recently spoke with um, one um, retailer who deals in um, tailoring and suits. And he told me in a bill that he pays um, around um, $200 for, there will be about um, 40 suits. And out of the 40 suits, only 10 of them can be sold. That means 30, 30 pieces of suit that comes out of the bill goes to waste directly. And in the, in the image I'm showing here, you can see like two huge sacks of, of clothing. And these are all clothing waste. And these are clothing waste from one day in one lane of the market in Cantamanto, which is the second kind of market in Ghana, that has not been sold. So imagine if Cantamanto covers um, about 22 acres of, of, of land space and seven acres is for the retail um, space. So imagine if um, every line of about, you know, every um, stretch of marketing space about um, 100 meters is able to pr produce this waste in a matter of one day. Imagine the amount of waste that is coming in like, like on the regular. So this like really like tells like the really dark side of all of this clothing waste and then donations as we call it. And if you, this is also um, waste from the dam site. So as these clothes are being piled in the market, they are being moved because there's no, there's no um, sanitary landfill in Ghana. The only one sanitary landfill in Ghana got expired over its expected time because there was so much like clothing waste coming in from Cantamanto, which is the second hand market. So now they are just like dump sites all like along the city and close to the market space, which is being used um, as a space to dump all of this clothing waste. So if you see from this picture, it's like several and several piles of, of clothing waste that has compounded over years. And these are all images of clothing waste. And if you see this image, one other thing, one of the dark side of clothing waste is you can see like this image is a community which is right by the, the clothing waste or the waste dump. And the thing is, 
the cloning ways or having these things happen also ends up to be a tool that people in authority or the government can use to disenfranchise the people living in these communities. Why? Because they will get blamed for being the ones creating this, um, this waste. But the thing is, they have no connection to it at all. They just found themselves there in that space and then the space got taken, got taken over as um, a dump space. And because they are, you know, they are people living in poverty, there's very little they can do about this. And then it's only a matter of time that the, they're going to use the waste as um, a tool to disenfranchise them or move them away from where they are, displace families from their friends and people that they know. So thinking about, and then this image too is an image from the beach. And I don't know if you can see clearly, but you can see all clothing tags. You can see H&M, you can see, um, well, it's only each name they can see, but you can see other clothing labels all tacked together. And aside um, this dumping side, aside the clothing waste that ends up in the market itself, all of this um, clothing waste also go through gutters and sewages and end up in the sea. And Ghana has a very huge um, fishing community, like people who live around, along the coast, fishing is basically their main means of livelihood. So if this clothing waste get into the sea, what they do is they got caught up in the net that they use and the motor the motorboats that they use for their, their fishing boat. And what happens is that there are so many instances where their motorboats get motorboats get crashed because the, the clothing waste are being caught in them. And then the fishing nets to grab these things, that means the fishing nets in the first place get destroyed. Secondly, they don't, they can't be able to catch any fish because the clothing waste have ruined them. And the thing is, because of the cloning waste, they now have to go even further away from the fishing zone that they are used to. They have to go further away because they have to go to a deeper end where they wouldn't be able to, the nets wouldn't be able to catch so many, um, so much cloning waste. So if you think about it, like just the fact that one person or we decided not to think about where the clothing we are wearing is going, you can see like all the ripple effects and then how it continually affects all of these people. And then even me talking about this thing is just, even on the, on the, like a very surface immediate level. But then if you think about it, it goes on and on and on and it doesn't break. So you can see here, like all of these, and then this is stuck into the beach sand that it is impossible for you to like drag it by your own strength. So this is how dark, and then you can see most of, even though they are plastic waste, that is undeniable, but most of these um, clothing waste that really affect um, the fashion business is mostly clothing waste. Samuel, I actually want you to keep these pictures up. And so I was hoping that you could actually talk to how the secondhand clothing trade is rooted in colonialism and share a bit from that, from that okay. uh, perspective. Yeah, lens as well. Can I okay. jump in too with a note just to add to that? I think yeah, for sure, Kate. Who, um, and these are incredible. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. But I think connected is uh, what who makes the money? I mean, people pay in Ghana so much for this bail. Who is um, who is making the money on the other end? So the real money, as I said, for the retailers, um, they are just doing this in a gamble. It's all a gamble because they are not sure what the, what is going to um, be in the bills that they've bought to to sell to resell. But the people who are really making money out of this business are the people who are um, exporting it into Ghana, are the agencies who are exporting it to Ghana. And then there are so many agencies that I don't have a lot of knowledge of, but then there are so many agencies who keep themselves in the wraps and under the shadows because they, I mean, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is wicked business. So nobody, I don't think anybody would want to bring their face out there to tell that this is what they're doing. But then those are the people making this money. Because the thing is, just um, in, in December, there was um, a fire outbreak in Cantamanto. And then most of these vendors in Cantamanto that um, resell these clothes actually take loans to purchase these items to sell. And as the fire happened, the fire was on the 15th of, of December. And um, on the 17th, I was there to, to check out what was going on to find out what was on the ground. And there were bankers, there were uh, bankers from, from banks where these market women have taken loans from who were dragging them for their monies. So in, in, so to speak, there is like very, very little protection for the people who are actually doing the actual work. Because if the exporters are spotting the clothes, they are just doing for the, for the business. But these market women, 
even though they might not be consciously aware of it, they are helping recirculate these clothes. And Encantamento is not based around the idea of just reselling. There are people who are reconstructing, there are people who are mending, there are people who are reprinting, there are people who, who are upcycling, there are people who are just taking apart pieces to be reused for something else altogether. So the people who are actually making the money are the people who are exporting like these clothes into, into the country. And talking about how um, uh, colonialism is uh, deeply rooted into the idea of, you know, the secondhand um, clothing and industry. I take it from this point. I, I often get the question, so if all of these problems like is going on and if all of these things are happening, why is it that like you're not saying no or why is it that you're not stopping it? First of all, the problem is not one of Cantamanto. Cantamanto is not a problem. Cantamanto is just like a very um, a sustainable module that exists so that you know clothes could be circulated. So Cantamanto is not a problem. If anything, Cantamanto is highlighting the problem and trying to solve the problem. Now, talking about how this is um, connected to um, colonialism, you see, before um, you know, white force came in here and then you know, colonize the asset. The whole idea of we had our own clothing, we were in our clothes, we we're making our own fabrics, we we're all making our own textiles, we we're making our own clothes. But then the whole idea of colonialism is that, you know, you have to basically dilute, wash down, strip the person away or the people away from what they know, trying to sanitize their, their minds and their livelihood into something else, trying to make them accept who you are as the ultimate standard for a living. So, if you have white people coming in and telling you, okay, this is how you dress, but this is not how you're supposed to dress. Because if you're, if you're going to work in a professional space, you have to dress in a shirt and a tie and a suit and a skirt and a pants, whatever, you have to wear all those things. That was not what Ghanaians um, were used to. We were used to wearing something else. So if you're being told that, you know, you can't go to school or you can work in an office space, or you can be in a certain event, or you can be in a certain social standing or a certain space because you're not dressed in a particular way. What happens is that you would, the people will quickly want to assimilate to these things. They would want to be able to fit into the new dynamics. And not everybody at the time, or not everybody would be able to afford the kind of clothing that the, the British people were making. Because at that time, nobody was making those clothes here. So if you're going to have it, it's going to, it's going to have to be shipped from, um, from Europe or wherever and brought to you. And what happened was that this really pushed the idea of, of the nation and secondhand. Because if you can if you you have to wear a certain type of clothing to exist in your own society and you can't afford this clothing. So what you do is you go to you find the, the, the nearest best option, which is secondhand. And I mean since that point it, it went on and on where people have to buy secondhand clothing because they have to go to school. People have to buy second clothing because they have to go to work. People have to buy second clothing because they have to be particular. They have to go to the hospital. Like even certain places where you have to get a service, you need to dress in a certain type of way to be to be recognized. And the thing is, as this thing goes on, if, for example, I am a parent and I feel like I have to dress a certain type of way to be able to work and provide for my family, the thing is, subconsciously, my children will also be picked up for me that I have to dress in this type of way to be respected. I have to be dressed in this type of way to be... Um, accepted in this society. And it goes on and on because I would definitely pass it on to my kids and then the kids and it'll go on and on. And the thing is, once things like this happen, it becomes a tradition. If something gets passed on for a very long time, it becomes a tradition. Even without particularly stating that this is a new tradition, it just becomes a tradition. And then one thing about tradition too, if it happens for a long time, it becomes a culture. And the thing about culture is, it's not something that you can just wake up and one day and say, you know, um, this is the, the, I mean, let's end this culture. It doesn't happen that way. Let's put something like, um, you know, uh, racism to this. We, there have been talk about racism for a long time, but then racism has been built into the system. It has, has been built into the structure of the world right now that it's not, even though we're talking about it, it's still happening. It's not something that goes away easily because it has become a culture. And this is the same way related to um, second clothing because it has happened it has been happening for a very long time. It's not something that will go away easily. And in talking about this, I also want to point back to the fact that if there has to be something done about this, it's not the issue of you know um, Ghana being able to ban um, um, second clothing or people stop buying bills or anything. The real issue has to be dotted from the source. And then the issue is with overproduction 
and over consuming, which is all exploitation of, 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 of justice and, 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 and human rights. So the whole idea of, of secondhand clothing and then its ways is has deeper connections than we just see on, on the surface. Wow, Samuel, thank you so much. I think I don't speak for just myself when and for everybody when I say that those pictures are horrifying and it's just such a hidden truth. I had, I mean, I just um, found out about this problem a few months ago, you know, and I've been working in this space for a few years now. And so I'm so glad that you could shine a light on this. And I think that, you know, it, it goes much deeper beyond um, just impacting the environment it, it mm -hmm. runs deep into it runs roots into like social health into cultural values and things like that so thank you so much um and i think everyone's like oh my gosh what are we supposed to do now and so that kind of leads us into our next question and i'll share my slides in a second but for um ella and um kate so how can we donate better? And I know that that's not the only solution to this problem, but it's definitely going to help. So, you know, what are some solutions um, to donating better and, and what role does circularity play in this? Yeah, so I know that seeing photos like this kind of makes us often feel like, what are we really supposed to do as individuals? But I'm a really big proponent for the fact that I think individual consumers can do something about it, um, just in the terms of like, we, uh, our actions do matter and they do cause a ripple effect. And we've seen that on a personal scale. I've seen that um, when I wrote my CBC article and then I had people constantly asking me in my own life what they could do and how they could shop secondhand. Like I saw that my actions had impacts on other people, but we've also seen that on a bigger scale. Like for instance, there was quite a few fast fashion companies last year that went bankrupt. Um, and a lot of them cited consumer choices as one of the reasons behind that. Uh, and then we've also seen brands like H&M try to become more sustainable. And I definitely have questions about whether or not they can actually do that. But I do think that consumers have a lot more power than um, than sometimes we think we do. And on that note, I also just quickly want to mention that one really good Instagram account that I follow is Clean Clothes Campaign. And they kind of talk more about the um, the after effects or the impacts of fast fashion companies and their relations to the actual factories that they work with and what happens when they don't fund those um, or don't pay back those factories in full uh, when something like bankruptcy or COVID happens. So I definitely suggest following them uh, because they often put out um, actions that people can do to actually contact the um, companies and call them out for that. But on the note of what we can actually do about it, um, I think that one really key thing, in my opinion, is trying to actually care about every piece of clothing that you have and keeping those things in good condition, because that definitely makes me feel more secure um, and feel like there's potential for my clothes to actually get reused. Uh, obviously, if you throw a bunch of stuff in a bag and it's all terrible quality and you bring that to Value Village, it's probably not going to get reused. Some of that might even get thrown out. Uh, right away. And so I think that's a really important aspect and something that um, I guess is kind of making secondhand fashion slower by actually thinking about every piece that we have and keeping those things in good condition. Uh, and I do want to quickly highlight um, a few options for donation, specifically in Vancouver, because that's kind of, I'm working really just off of my personal experience here. But, um, but relating to that, in general, just make sure to do your research into where you're donating, because there's a big difference between donating to some big uh, secondhand chain versus donating to your local thrift store. And a lot of the more localized thrift stores uh, are actually also kind of social enterprises. So they'll donate the uh, money that they make, or they might hire people um, and as a way to give back to different charities and organizations within your city, uh, which I think kind of makes your contributions to those places a bit more intersectional and kind of keeping in mind the social impacts as well as the environmental impacts. So uh, within Vancouver, there's a few stores that I really like. Um, there's Miscellany Finds, Aunt Leia's Thrift Store, Community Thrift and Vintage, wildlife thrift store and turnabout community. And all of those places 
uh, they have kind of a social enterprise aspect to their uh, thrift stores. And another thing you can do is donate directly to uh, shelters. So like in Vancouver, we have the women's and the children's shelters and you know they're always in need of different donations. And another thing you can do is bring your clothes directly to places like in Vancouver, um, like temporary housing units like KT Camp. Uh, and when you bring things to those kind of places, keep in mind that obviously people in those situations might be storming the weather a bit more. So things that are on the warmer side, like if you have a big winter jacket or something you wanna donate, that's a really ideal place to bring those kind of things. So yeah, I think in general, just um, relating all that back is really doing your research into where you're donating and thinking about where your clothes are ending up and kind of the whole life cycle of your clothes rather than once you don't have them, they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. And I think that's how we deal with a lot of environmental issues in the global north is we kind of think that once once it's not in front of us, the same goes for recycling, packaging, all that kind of stuff, that it's not really our problem. And these uh, processes like thrift stores and recycling systems, they kind of allow us to do that because we can kind of have the burden lifted off of our shoulders once they're out of our hands. But I think it's really essential for us because we have that privilege of having these systems that we can utilize to actually take the time to think about where our clothes are ending up and maybe even taking it upon ourselves to educate ourselves or research, uh, watch documentaries, look at articles, you know, listen to people like Samuel talk who knows so much more firsthand than I do about where these things are ending up. So uh, yeah, that's some of the, the things that I would suggest is doing research uh, and also um, caring about every piece of clothing that you have. Thank you so much. Yeah, Kate, do you have anything else to kind of mitigate that clothing waste piece? Yeah, yeah. I just want to thank Samuel for that incredible presentation. I mean, what one of the things that struck me is that we worry so much about plastics in the ocean and not to say that that's not a serious problem, but we're seeing that build from things that we are deliberately doing, like we are deliberately donating our clothes thinking, you know, it's going to go, they're going to go to a good place. And, and that's what happens. I feel like there's sort of a lot to think about there in terms of how we conceptualize waste and what we throw away and what we donate. I will also say just about the, the talk a little bit on the bigger scale here, just thinking about charity organizations and big charity, I guess there's a lot to be said there that people are starting to write about how these huge NGOs work almost in a corporate fashion. And, and there's a lot to investigate there. Um, and I've also, I'm in, currently in the, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And one thing that has just happened is that some of the Goodwill stores closed, uh, which is fascinating to me because I guess it's a COVID thing, whether people are giving more or, or were giving less or what was going on, but that is, that's kind of interesting because I know that those were also a good source of clothing for people who are poor around here and we have tremendous inequality here where we are. So there is that sort of dual thing. So if people are donating, where's it going? Um, let's see, made some notes here. Um, the right to repair. I think that that Ella was just talking about, about that. Um, that's a, really important movement and it cuts across both clothing, electronics, um, furniture, shoes, all these things that we've gotten used to in a disposable economy. But it's um, it we're losing these skills. And in some cases, these skills are being taken away from us. Uh, that's been happening in the electronics industry for ages as our devices become harder and harder to repair and reuse and resell. And the fact that, that these companies kind of own the, the intellectual property that would enable us to do that. Clothing is a little different, but because on the whole, it's being made so badly right now, um, it's hard to repair and we really, and we're losing the skills. I think that that's something that people talk about um, certainly with sort of my generation and a bit younger is that we just don't repair things anymore. I can sew on buttons. That's about all I can do. And I'm hoping that, that we're starting to relearn those skills and to see it as a political thing. It's nice to repair. It's great to repair and reuse, but you're, you're undertaking a political act when you do that. And I think that's so important uh, to realize that 
uh, you're you're striking a blow against, against big corporations. Uh, buying less, I will just I will I will just just keep saying that and working out what one needs and what one uses. I think at the other end of the chain, the clothing, the informal labor, the um, sweatshop labor around making our clothing and how that whole system works just has to be disrupted as well. That's, they work under incredibly bad conditions. Um, and in terms of what we wear and buy, uh, I always think, I love Marie Kondo's method. A friend of mine said, well, maybe we should be encouraging people to hug clothes in the store and discover if they, if they, and things in the store and discover if they give you joy. But I'm seeing all these amazing suggestions coming up here about where to donate and how to donate. And I agree that finding shelters, picking up the clothes that are really going to be useful. My stepdaughter's grown out of a whole bunch of things and I've got things in the car to take like her warm coats and good clothes to take um, someplace when I, when I figure out exactly where. Um, so doing that research, and I think being informed citizens, not just being consumers, again, it's hard work, but I think sharing this knowledge, sharing this information in a foundation like this is, is um, incredible. So, um, and then I'm just, I'm just going through my, getting through vaccination and thinking about the post COVID era, but I think one thing that I will say has been an opportunity is to stare at the clothes in my closet that I just don't wear anymore. I mean, I have like sweatpants and um, uh, sort of good shirts that I wear, uh, but otherwise like, I don't need all of that. What am, I don't need to buy anything for like another five years. I'm just gonna keep wearing what I'm wearing. And I think that's been getting out of that. Like I'm always running around stress sort of thing and thinking, okay, now I can actually sit down and contemplate what's in my closet. <laughs> it's kind of been, been almost uh, meditational. Um, so I, um, I will probably leave it there. I, can, I know there are questions in the chat. Maybe we can all come back to those. But anyway, so that, that's kind of my global perspective that goes down to what you do at a very local level and to realize that there are many alternatives that we can, we can do all along the clothing supply chain. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, Kate, those are great suggestions. And I think before we move on to the next question, Samuel, let me know if you want to share slides again. Um, is that even for me, I hide my clothes because <laughs> I always remember like getting bought, like going through boxes in my house and being like, I forgot about that shirt. And I think this comes from me being an over consumer and I can definitely acknowledge that, especially growing up, but like just hide your clothes and don't look at them for six months. And when you open the box back up, you get excited to like wear that sweater again and things like that. So that's my one tip. Um, but yeah, so Samuel, hey, this is- I love your tip. Oh. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to um, what Kate said. Um, and Ella as well. Um, for me, I think one thing, I mean, I am not in the global now, but I feel one thing, if truly your your idea of giving out code is to donate, think about it. Like if you're going to donate a piece of code that is like, you know, stained, has wine stains, have like blood stains, I mean, you will not wear, you will not give to like your brother by you, you not give it to your mother or anybody. Then why would you think like anybody would want to wear it just because they are poor? I think we should be conscious about, you know, even if it comes to a point where you have to actually donate, you have to really think about the piece of clothing that you actually think of donating. Because, I mean, donation is supposed to be an act of kindness, not an act of insult. So if you're going to give a piece of clothing for someone to wear, and I mean, even you yourself wouldn't wear it, are you being kind? I think we should also be conscious of that. Yeah. And... Um, Okay, so moving to okay, sorry, I, I took <laughs> I took the introduction out of your mouth. <laughs> why don't why don't you ask the question and answer it too? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um what does sustainable fashion look like in Ghana versus um the global north? Huh. So um I always say this that um I mean living here since my childhood and stories from my parents and what I've seen, one thing that I can say from a very personal level is that in Ghana, people are actually sustainable by nature. And I mean, I could give so many endless examples and scenarios like around this. And then one example is um, growing up, one thing that always happened like when you were small is that 
like really were you um being like bought new clothes for like really were you were you getting any new clothes and what happened was that all of the clothes were actually being tailor-made or custom-made so if you want like for example this shirt you go to um the person who makes the batik or the textile designer or the, the textile um, seller or retailer go buy the textile or get the textile be made you send it to the dressmaker you have your measurement taken you discuss you know um where you're going to wear it to the design that you want and even with the cuts like this is always made like traditional and like dress that are actually made in the Ghanaian way are always made with excess um, allowance in it with the idea that if you sh you're going to wear it for a long time and the body changes so as you grow bigger or as you grow older or taller you will be able to um, take out those allowances and make it fit again and the idea of what, what I was saying about children was that clothes that were made for adults the scraps were being put together and then that was what was used to make clothes for for the kids i wish i had some images to share but most of my my childhood pictures with my parents at the parties or at church it was always me being dressed in what my mom was wearing or what my dad was wearing and talking about one particular style too that is very popular in in ghana among women is one style called kaba and slit and is um, um a style of dress which is like a, a, a blouse and then like a long skirt and then this skirt is made in such a way that it is not cut is just being stitched like several in such a way that if it, it takes your form and once after a while if you should feel like you you don't want to wear that particular skirt anymore you're able to just like um, take all the stitches out and you have like a full stretch of fabric that you can use to make another skirt make anything else basically so if you think about like all of these things and you know how um like traditional Ghanaian fashion or traditional Ghanaian clothing is revolved around. It really revolves around the relationship with clothing. And I think one of the biggest issue that like makes the issue of sustainable fashion almost unachievable is because people don't have any relationship with clothing anymore. But the thing in Ghana is like people actually have relationship with clothing. Like every time that I visit my mom or my grandma, it's always amazing how like they have like amazing stories to tell about a particular type of clothing and then how much, how many times they've redesigned it or restyled it into something else. And it's just amazing. But I feel the global north has grown into a stand where like all of these things are being covered without any sense of attachment, any sense of relationship. So the moment that relationship is broken away, you don't think, I mean, you wouldn't think about anything if you don't have a relationship with it. And then I think um, Kate made a statement that the reason why all of these things happened, her very first statement was that people don't think about clothes. And the reason why people don't think about clothes is because they have no relationship with it. So if you think about it on that level, like I think like generally and naturally, Ghanaians have a lean towards like a very sustainable living generally. And if you think about modern times, even Ghanaian designers, myself included, tend to always find ways to incorporate like um, um, a second clothes and clothes that have been used before, recycling and putting clothes together. Because the whole um, idea or one thing that really exists in, in, in the Ghanaian culture is passing clothes on, like passing clothes to, to somebody else. So there's always this idea of making clothes like in a better quality course, at the end, you're going to pass it on to someone else. And this is not something that is actually thought. Nobody, I've never in my life, as I was growing up, had, you know, people having a seminar or talk about how to, to, to make your clothes better or how to wear your clothes for a long time. It was, it's just something that just generally exists among us without even giving, you know, like thought about it. It just exists. So I think if you talk about um, how sustainable fashion uh, looks here in, in, in Ghana as compared to the global north, it's because people actually still have relationship with clothing and textiles in generally. And then for that reason, they pay more attention to what they're wearing. They, they are more conscious of where the clothes is being ended up. They are more conscious of where the clothes is coming. For example, if, as I was saying about how clothing is being made traditionally in Ghana, you go to the textile place, you have your, your kente or your fabric being woven or being printed you take it to the designer so right from the onset you've been part of the whole process 
But here's the case where you are sitting in your house, you just take your phone, Zara tells you, oh, you have to buy this shit or you are not happy. And then, okay, you feel the need to buy it. So you buy it. But then that is it. You have no connection to where the clothes was made, where the material was being sourced from, who made the, the, the clothing, how it got to you. you. You have no knowledge of those things. And then because you have no knowledge of, no knowledge of where it's coming from, you probably wouldn't even pay attention of where it's going to end up in the first place. So the moment that relationship or that association or attachment to clothing is broken, that means like the whole idea of sustainable fashion is lost. So I think if you talk about um, sustainable fashion in Ghana as, as, as versus the global north, this is like the big difference for me, the relationship with clothing. That is so critical. Thank you so much. Um, it's just that piece where, you know, it can, be a com it can become a tradition in your family and pass something down and it has more meaning. Like my mom knitted me a horse sweater when I was in high school and I know that I'm going to pass it down to my kids because I want to embarrass them by wearing a horse on their sweater, but also it's really special to me and it carries a lot of sentimental value. So just having that, uh, that mindset shift, I think is beautiful. Um, cognizant of time, we also have some really great questions. We're just going to skip to the last slide. Um, just talking about solutions moving forward. Um, and if the, I want to hear from each panelist. So if you could give us your answer in like one minute or less, that would be amazing because we do want to share with you some information about our giveaway, um, which we'll also be sending out in an email. So don't worry, you won't miss that information. Um, and then we'll get into our Q&A really quickly. Uh, for anyone that has to leave right on the hour, that's totally okay. We'll probably go a little bit over just answering some questions if that's okay with everyone. Um, but yeah, so for solutions, moving forward, what needs to change on, on that systemic level and what can participants start doing today to disrupt fashion waste? And we can start with Kate and then we can go with Ella and then Samuel, how about that order? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. And I'll do this briefly. Um, I think that this is what all of us have said is that what we throw away, not just clothing or donate, um, it, we distance it. That's we, 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 we expect is out of sight, out of mind. We don't think about where it goes. It's, it's actual distancing. Um, so much of what we throw away travels very long distance, distance, but also psychological or mental distancing. And, and I think one of the things I always say to people in talks is spend a bit of time in your communities looking at waste, what's in the bins, who's picking it up. Everywhere around you is, is you can see a, a world of waste once you start looking at it. And I think that, again, can really help change your relationship with um, with waste. Uh, and this is something I can talk about, but it just to really bring up with COVID has been a big issue too with, uh, we can see it with uh, losing reusable cups to take them to stores and, and that sort of thing, as well as medical waste that's everywhere. Uh, because I, I also have a background in international relations, I know that there's a big effort to have some kind of treaty around oceans plastics. So let's, let's go back to that and, and plastic waste. It's just not, clothing waste is not talked about. Um, my understanding is that some countries in Africa have put legislation in place to stop these imports, uh, but that's not always as easy to do if there are people willing to keep buying and selling. So there is still that market that um, that, that is um, true for any kind of trade. But I think it would be interesting. I haven't done a lot of work to connect to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but I really like the work that you all are doing to make that connection. I'd be really interested to see what you do. So I think hitting this at the global level is just invisible there. And I think that would be really cool to do. Yeah, that's a really great point, Kate. I also want to add that I think people really need to rethink the order of how they purchase and consume and buy, you know, clothes, but this really applies to anything that they buy. So I think we need to keep in mind that before like the recycling stage or the buying secondhand stage, there's so many stages that come before that, like repairing, um, swapping, restyling, all of those things should really be the priority. And then secondhand, rather than it being secondhand and then sustainable fashion and then fast fashion, it should really be like buying something new to you in general should be kind of the last step in that. Uh, and in addition, uh, I think that oftentimes we kind of feel like 
um, once we're kind of doing our part. So let's say like we switched to buying secondhand and that's something I did um, years ago. That wasn't like the end of the story for me. So that was a challenge I took on because I wanted to see that behavioral change within my own life. And I wanted to see if I could do it. So I set kind of a challenge for myself to do that for a year. And then once I did that for a year, it became so easy and I didn't have any desire to go back to buying anything other than secondhand, but that's not where it ended. So once I started doing that, then I started to think more about how many individual pieces I was consuming, um, the quality of the materials, so that things, I would try to look for things that would last longer, nicer brands um, and nicer materials, so that I knew that those are pieces that could stay in my wardrobe forever, like Samuel was saying. Um, and, also in general, I, I really have tried to buy more basics because that's something I used to do a lot. And one of the reasons I was constantly spring cleaning was because I would buy all these like fun, you know, trendy pieces, but then um, I didn't have anything to pair them with or the trend would end and like I was buying them all secondhand. So in that way, it was a bit better, but I still think that that's kind of an over consumer mindset to have. So I think instead, um, if you want to try out a trend, maybe ask some of your friends if they have those pieces and you can try them out and see if you like that silhouette or that shape on yourself or that style so that you know that even though it's a trend, it's something you actually will want to keep in your closet. Uh, and yeah, just really shifting the mindset to have a wardrobe where every single piece in your wardrobe you love and the majority of those things you're not cycling in and out of your closet constantly. You're maybe adding, you know, two or three pieces per season um, instead of always having to buy into the new trends. Okay, so hello. Hi, we are good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, one thing that I would like to say is, or like also connecting to my last point, is really starting to connect with the clothing that we wear. Because, I mean, clothing is a big part of our lives. I, I don't know how people really don't see this. It's a big part of our lives. And I think if we really start to pay attention to the clothing that we wear, where it's coming from, where it's going, and the fact that if we continue to live the way we live, we sort of like give strength and fuel like global exploitation. Because the issue of waste and all of these things, fast fashion and then over consuming and over production is all built on exploitation. So like you really have to think about it. Just put yourself like in the shoes of all of these people. Are you really happy, happy buying all of these things just to wear them for one day at the expense of like, like, you know, an entire livelihood, like entire families, an entire people, an entire culture. Are you really like looking to doing that? So I think that is one mindset that we all should have. Because the moment that you start thinking that way, you become a little bit more conscious of how you are um, contributing to the, the whole issue. And um, um, I think one thing that we should also be conscious of is also being, I mean, it also connects to having a relationship with the clothing. You should also be conscious about the clothing that you buy enough that you, you know that you're buying quality and things that you need. Because if you're going to buy something that is just poor quality, that means, I mean, in a couple of days, it's just going to go bad and you're going to put it away and you're going to buy something else. And what happens on is just, you just keep the, the chain going on and on. Yeah, and to end this, one thing that, I mean, all of us here could help is also um, at the Aura Foundation, we, um, as I mentioned, there was a fire in Cantamanto in December, and we're still trying to um, raise funds in helping as a, a relief for the retailers who got affected by the fire. So I'm gonna leave the link, or you can just visit the Aura Foundation on Instagram and just follow the link tree to the Nutrition website. Whatever you're able to donate will go a long way to helping all of these people. Thank you very much. <laughs>Sorry, I can't find my mute button. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This isn't the last we'll hear from you. We, I know we have a few great questions from the audience, but I think those are great pieces that are a preventative action. It's not a band-aid solution. It's actually getting to the root cause of the issue and trying to you know, make that change for good, which I think is so critical. 
um, you might hear me speed talking just a little bit, just because um, I just want to quickly share with everybody. So this isn't the end of our Close Busters campaign. We have a lot more upcoming events throughout the month of April. We talk about fashion trends and fashion psychology. We have a Davos Youth Dialogue panel where we talk about consumerism in general, not just clothes, just goods and goods. And honestly, consumerism, I think, runs our lives and we don't even notice it. So hopefully we become more cognizant of that. And then the last one is um, talking about the environmental and social implications of our clothing. And it's featuring the one of the producers of the documentary River Blue. Um, and so we're really excited about those. And um, you can stay tuned on our website. We have all of the events up, so you can definitely register there. Um, so this isn't the end of the journey. Please stay in touch with us. We run on feedback. So if you would want to speak at a Textile Talks event or you want to learn more about our organization, those are our contacts on the slide. You can also follow us at Threading Change on Instagram. And um, the support really allows us to like keep doing our, keep doing our work and, and carrying out our mission. And so we would really appreciate all of the support. Um, also, uh, so just a big thank you to everybody, to our panelists, to our community, to our audience, and also to Van City for supporting us and allowing us to do this. Uh, fashion is an intersectional issue, and so it's really important to shed a light on that and to have education on this subject. Um, and so we do have a few audience questions. So Robert Wright asked. Sorry, first uh, Brenna, Brenna can we plug the? Yeah. Can we plug oh, the? Oh the yeah, form? we're gonna plug the giveaway. Giveaway. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I forgot. I got excited. No I problem. Okay, I just want to tell everyone that we have some giveaways coming up. Um, most importantly, though, there's a survey in the chat. So if you could uh, do us a favor and fill it out, it should only take about three minutes to do just to give us some feedback on this webinar and to give us a little bit of data. Um, but the first giveaway is going to be for the attendees of webinar one and two that fill out the survey. You're going to get a month long um, sign up to audiobooks.com and then you're also going to get access to the book which is named Secondhand Travels in the New Global Garage Sale. Uh, we are also going to have a giveaway for webinars three and four for those who fill out the survey as well. Um, and that prize is going to be uh, a 30 minute conscious consumer consultation with Recycle to Riches, which is really exciting. So if you're feeling like you need some tips and tricks on how to be a little more sustainable, that's going to be a great prize for you. Um, and then our third giveaway is going to be happening on Instagram, and we're going to be giving away a beginner's mending kit and a book along with that. So if you're wanting to learn some of those skills that were mentioned about repairing your clothes, you can uh, follow the steps on Instagram that will be coming out shortly. Um, and if you win, you're going to get that. That's all from me. Okay, amazing. So um, we'll also be linking um, our website and how you can stay tuned with more of our events and register for them. Um, so I got very excited, clearly, to the questions. Um, Robert asked the question of, does the type of clothing make a difference? So like cotton, uh, cotton and wool versus synthetics. Um, and he also wondered if there's a country or market that you think has got it right. And that's for the all of our panelists, whoever can speak to it, go for it. Um, I think it really does make a difference, um, <clears throat> the type of um, clothing that is coming in, because, I mean, we all, the truth is, no clothing waste is, is, there's no good clothing waste, there's no bad clothing waste, but the thing is, some of them have more adverse effects on the environment than others, and also thinking about it, in, in our part of the world, um, it's very warm here. So some of the things actually, aside the, the waste that will come along with it, is not necessarily the best or the most comfortable thing for anybody to, to wear or buy again. Because, I mean, if you're bringing a fur coat here, who's going to wear a fur coat here in Ghana? And um, talking about um, places where it's been gotten right, I mean, I can't, I don't know of one. I really don't know of a place where it's gotten it right. If there's anything that I can say is that Cantamanto has really built a very good um, sustainable module around itself. The fact that it's not just um, people selling clothes, but it's like clothes being sold, mended, upcycled, and all of these things going on. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I just have to agree with that. I don't know of any any place that's really getting this getting this right. I mean, uh, you assume that places, you know, it's always like Scandinavia is often held up as a, as an example of things doing doing things right in the waste world. But I I just I just don't yeah I just don't know. So I can think of general models, but in this case. Um, I think it's it's something again we haven't really thought about, and again more natural textiles, and certainly types of clothes that fit where you might be sending things to. If you know that, um, microplastics in the oceans are yet another source of um, ocean pollution, and that's from um, often from just washing, but generally from artificial fabrics, including the fleece that many of us like to wear in, in West Coast climates. So. That is also um, worth thinking about in terms of all your decisions. So again, um, clothing that can maybe be made, materials that can be made into something else. This was something I was thinking about when Samuel was speaking that can they be a blanket? Can they be a tablecloth? Can they, you know, is there anything that you think of that I, it's hard to, to really kind of immediately think of examples, but that again is like, it might not just be clothing. It can something be something else as well. Okay, um, I'm having technical difficulties, uh, which is why I'm not on TikTok because I would not be able to navigate that system. Um, those were great. And I think, yeah, talking about circularity is so important and it's something that you should think at the beginning of any consumption choice or any behavioral choice that you choose to embark on. It's just, what can I use? Like, what is, what is the purpose for this? How can we create the end cycle so that it's not just being turned into waste at the end? Can I turn it into something else? Can I make it a rag? Can I weave these together and make a weird blanket or, or anything like that? Just ha having that um, behavior change over time, I think will, will make impact um, and help mitigate so much waste that we're creating all the time. Um, our last question was from Mira and she was wondering how much demand is there for secondhand clothing in Ghana compared to your own domestic textile or apparel industry? Um, so kind of asking about the state of the textile industry in Ghana, Ghana and what it looks like. Okay, so there's still an existing um, textile industry and there's still an existing fashion industry. But the thing is at the rate of which, um, you know, clothing waste of second clothing is coming in it's gotten to a point where there's more clothing in coming in than the continental resellers could ever work on. Like there's so much and there's more coming in like every day. It's not, it's not like it comes up at a particular point and it stops at a particular point. It's constantly coming in because people are constantly buying clothes and, and then clothes are constantly being made. So it will constantly come in. But the thing is, even though there's still an existing um, um, textile industry and fashion industry, which is going on and then growing, um, as I see it. The thing is, the more this happens, what tends to um, be the issue for me is it wouldn't be long until the growing generation will get synthesized to the idea that, I mean, secondhand will be the fast fashion because there will be so much clothes available for cheap that and poor quality that, okay, I know that I can go to Cantamon and buy a t-shirt today and then tomorrow I can go and get another one too because they have been moved from the idea of, of, of paying attention to clothes and having the relationship clothes, which is what is happening in the global north right now. And I mean, before um, the 70s, I'm pretty sure we didn't have an issue, even the global north, there wasn't an issue of, of fast fashion until now. So my fear right now, or talking about how people are accepted or about the fashion or clothing industry in Ghana, is that it is only a matter of time if, if, if care or structures are not put in place that the growing generation's mind will shift from, from, from making clothes or from, from their relations or consciousness with clothing will move. And then it will only be fast fashion. And then the thing talking about, you know, all of these things is that there, there, have, been, there have been talks that all of these things is actually to move people towards the idea of, of, of fast fashion brands. Because if you have a place like Cantamanto where you can go in and get like all of these fast fashion brands already, it will not be a matter of time people will shift to buying fast fashion clothes itself from the shops because it's both equally cheap. And then these are ones that you get, you get from the store, not ones that you get from, you know, like the market floor. 
So if we talk about how it affects the clothing industry and how much people really consume it, as I said, Cantamento is only there highlighting the problem and trying to solve the issue in its own way. But I mean, it's only, one can only solve a problem if the problem is there. But if it's a continuous problem, it's only a matter of time the problem overrides whoever is solving the problem. So that is the issue of, of, of how people are accepting it in its relation to the fashion industry and the textile industry in Ghana. I think um, it speaks to the resiliency of, you know, Ghana and other parts of Africa that are dealing with this problem. But again, with, with even with indigenous people in Canada, you know, climate change and its impacts will eventually override their ability for self-reliance and their ability to be resilient to those effects. And so we can only do so much and we're a part of the solution. And so I think, you know, it's not always about personal, like individual action because we're only doing so much, but we do need to think about it on that individual level, on larger scales in terms of governance and policy. And, you know, you wanna to start to become cognizant of these issues so that you can demand better um, systemic change and, and better uh, a better way of doing things in the future. So I love that every, all of the panelists have spoken to this and you've all spoken so well. And I know that I said this, but thank you again so much for uh, being with us here today and for just shining some light on this really critical issue and you all have such a wealth of knowledge. And so I hope that our, um, I hope that our participants feel like they're taking away something. And, and before you leave today, everybody, if you do feel inclined, like please let us know in the chat what you're taking away, whether it's like a thought, a feeling, um, like a, a little piece of information that you didn't know before. Um, we'd love to know what you're, what you're taking away from this. We kind of use the head and the heart model. So it can either be like heart, how are you feeling? Or head, what did you learn kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, thank you again. Please do our survey. Um, we have more events coming up, so please register for those. Um, and we also have our giveaway. And um, if the panelists want to share in the chat how um, the audience can stay in touch with your work and how they can, you know, just keep in contact with you, if you don't mind just writing that down for everybody, that would be amazing because we want to continue this dialogue and this discussion. Great. So yeah, you can find Ella on Instagram at Ella, I'm assuming that's two underscores, KM. Um, and she posts a lot of educational information. Here, I'm going to post Samuel's email because he accidentally <laughs> direct messaged me. <laughs> uh, also take a look at the slow, at Slow Fashion. They're an organization. They do a lot of um, open education ses sessions. And Samuel was with them for their fashion and waste seminar um, and he gives like a really a really great talk kind of about what we we discussed today but if you feel like it I would definitely watch that episode and Kate sharing her information too but she's really bad at email so um, check her Berkeley webpage for her Calendly links for meetings uh, so yeah feel free to um, pop off the webinar now but thank you to everybody again this was amazing we're all so happy i wish i had music thanks so much hey, so little confetti i just wanted to say um one last just a little thing i think you, you guys did great with organizing this um event um i mean i've been with a lot of webinars but you, like you are constantly emailing and sending reminders i think this is the first um one that I've been on where like you get three reminders before like the event itself. Cause <laughs> I got one at 24 hours. I got one to six hours. I got one to one hour. I think you guys are doing like a really, really great job. And then I'll, I'm also very, very impressed with your graphics and your visuals. I think it's, it's, it's very nice. It's just very pleasing. I was, it took me um, a while to just like appreciate the slides before I even read any, any of the information on it. It was just very interesting. So great job oh, to y'all. Thank you. <laughs>
honestly, the graphics would not be possible without Carissa. She's a magician with uh, with graphics, and uh, I just put the slides together. But that means so much. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to just make sure you all felt prepared for the session, so I did email you quite a lot. But <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> Great job, Chris, Carissa. You did, I, I really love the visual. I was just showing my friends. But I wasn't, I was showing my friends the visual before I was even talking about the information. I was like, oh, look at this very interesting visual. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciated your message. I don't remember exactly what you said on Instagram, but I was like, yeah, this guy's a designer. So that means, you know, I'm doing something right. <laughs> it is great. So will the recording be available? I want my students to see it because it's been so... Um, it's been it's been such an informative webinar. Oh, that would be amazing. Yes, we're recording. We'll probably upload it to YouTube, um, and I'll also just send it to. Um, I'll also send it to the. You'll receive another email from me, so uh, <laughs> I'll send you all of the information. And uh, yeah, we'll be sending out emails. We're not done yet, but um, this was a great relationship. I hope that we stay in contact and we can still be involved with each other's work because this is great. Yeah. Thank you so much for facilitating. You did a really great job. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I start, I feel like I started I started a podcast this year, and so I think it helped with my uh, public speaking skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. So, so yeah, uh, feel free to pop off. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to want to say a big thank you to Kate and Ella as well. Um, yep. It was great having this um, conversation. It was very nice bouncing off of like what you're saying, and it made it very easier, very um, comfortable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. It was so yeah. great, and it was so interesting. I feel like I'm not sure. I don't want to speak on Kate's behalf, but I feel like I have almost the exact opposite experience from you. Um, so you're kind of showing like the what actually happens. And for me, it's more like where it starts and trying to think about where it happens. So yeah. I'm really happy that yeah. we got to share both those perspectives. I'm yeah, glad. <laughs> a great conversation. Hope we get to continue it at some point. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave now.